The stone which the builders refused has become the headstone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Let us go to our God in silent prayer. Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, our help is in the name of Jehovah who made heaven and earth. Grace, mercy, and peace be granted unto you from God our Father and Jesus Christ the Lord, with the operation of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Let's sing 242. 242, God, the source of joy. Let's sing the four stanzas. Let's hear from the law of God that is found in Deuteronomy chapter 5. 
I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Thou shalt have none other gods before me. Thou shalt not make thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the waters beneath the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself unto them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Keep the Sabbath day to sanctify it, as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thine ox, nor thine ass, nor any of thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates, that thy manservant and thy maidservant may rest as well as thou. And remember, thou wast a servant in the land of Egypt, and that the Lord thy God brought thee out thence through a mighty hand and by stretched out arm. Therefore the Lord thy God commanded thee to keep the Sabbath day. Honor thy father and thy mother, as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee, that thy days may be prolonged, and that it may go well with thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill, neither shalt thou commit adultery, neither shalt thou steal, neither shalt thou bear false witness against thy neighbor, Neither shalt thou desire thy neighbor's wife, neither shalt thou covet thy neighbor's house, his field, or his manservant, or his maidservant, his ox, or his ass, or anything that is thy neighbor's. Lord Jesus Christ gives us the summary of the law. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy mind, with all thy soul, and with all thy strength. This is the first and the great commandment. Second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all of the law and the prophets. Let's sing 158. 100, I'm sorry, 233. 233. In Psalm 86, let's sing 1, 3, 1 through 3, 5 and 6. 1 through 3, 5 and 6.
Let's call upon God's holy name. Our Father in heaven, there is no God but thee. All the gods of men are idols, figments of the imaginations, revelations of the sinful heart of man and of his rebellion against thee because that seeing that thou art and that thou must be served, even beholding thy eternal power and Godhead in the creation that is made, and by means of every created thing, seeing thy glory and hating thee from the depth of his being, he fashions an idol after his own imagination and after the darkness of his depraved heart. And the idols of the heathen give witness, therefore, that man knows that thou art. And the idols of modern man, sophisticated, but no less idols, idols of their health and idols of their money and idols of their businesses and homes, idols of their families, idols of an outward adherence to an institution, idols of their own comfortable life, and idols that all give witness that they know thee, and that thou must be served, and that they hate thee in the depth of their being. For, O Lord, that there is no God but thee, must also be joined this confession, that there is no God like thee, a God of infinite power, perfect sovereignty, of stunning, brilliant holiness, a God who is good in all that thou art, good in all that thou doest, a God who is life and light in whom there is no darkness or shadow of turning. A God who is fullness, so that eternally thou didst dwell in perfect covenant fellowship in thyself, enjoying thyself as God. Father, beholding the Son in the Spirit, embracing him. The Son beholding the Father in the Spirit, loving him. In thee is life, and that life is the life of glorious, perfect, divine fellowship and friendship. And of that life, thou hast determined that man might know it and participate in it to enjoy thee to know thee forever, the God at whose right hand are pleasures forevermore. And Lord, we worship thee, and we humble ourselves before thee, and we thank thee for thy grace, for we know that it is thy good pleasure for the revelation of thy glorious being of thy just severity and of thy great grace that some, indeed a remnant, only be saved to show that salvation is of the Lord and that many would perish in their unbelief 
and their carnality and their other sins. And Lord, cause us to submit to that will even as it comes into our own lives and as a church as we proclaim the gospel that salvation is of the Lord that vain is the help of man that there is no strength in man or in the son of man that he can get anything or gain anything or achieve anything of himself. But that all blessing flows from thee and that to us according to thy eternal will and good pleasure. That thou art sovereign over salvation and damnation among all thy rational moral creatures. And that thou art God alone, God to be worshipped and served, praised and honored and glorified, and thy perfect goodness. And Lord, we therefore confess this morning our sin, that we frequently forget thee that we do not live consciously in the light of thy favor. And we serve ourselves. And Lord, forgive us these our transgressions and all our other transgressions against thy holy law. Teach us, O Lord, to know our sin. Humble us before thy face, for there is nothing that is more foreign to men than to be humble before thee, our God. But we, as the children of Adam, desire to be God. And so, Lord, teach us that we are nothing, that our spiritual and physical life is absolutely dependent from moment to moment and for all eternity upon thee. Show us, Lord, thy covenant and our children too. Teach us of our salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. We worship him this morning. We confess that he is God, true God of true God, light of light, begotten, not made, of the same essence with the Father, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was made man, so that he partook of our flesh and our blood to suffer upon the tree of the cross for our iniquity. We confess that we believe that all our sins were imputed to him, that he paid for them there upon the cross of Calvary, and that all his righteousness is imputed to us. And Lord, ever confirm us in the righteousness of Christ, that our salvation, that our favor in thy sight, that thy blessing upon us in our life, that our reception of salvation and the experience of salvation is wholly dependent upon Jesus Christ and his perfect work. Lord, apply that to us by a true and living faith so that we rest in Thee and we trust in Thee and we find all our comfort and hope in Jesus Christ. 
ask, Lord, for a blessing upon our congregation. Thou seest us that there is with us no strength, that we are weak and afflicted and sorrowful, despised of the world and the church world, counted as the off-scouring of society, and estranged from our own brethren. We ask, Lord, that thou wilt ever strengthen us, each one of us, in our respective callings, situations, and struggles. Strengthen us by thy grace. Lead and guide us by thy spirit. Ever hold us in the hollow of thy hand and ever assure us that as the engraving upon thy palms we are always before thy face so that in everything thou dost work our good also in the bearing of the cross of Jesus Christ. We ask, Lord, that thou wilt be with our office bearers in their work and labor Strengthen them, multiply their labors for the good of the church. Grant unto us thy grace that we might receive them from Jesus Christ, that we might hear the word at their mouth, and that we might cause in all of our life that they might do their labor with joy and not with sorrow, be with our marriages and families, our homes, our children, that in everything we might serve Thee, not ourselves. We might seek heaven, that our life here below may be as a passing stranger, not as one who has a settled place here, one whose home is in heaven and who presses on toward that heavenly home, forgetting the things that are behind and pressing forward to the things that are before us. We thank thee, Lord, that thou hast gathered us here in this day, calling us out of the world and assembling us to worship thee. Be with the minister, giving to him unction of the Spirit to preach thy word and apply that word, <laughs> and that by the word of his mouth he may edify both himself and us, and that we may receive it, as it is in truth not the word of man, but the very word of God. Pardon, Lord, all our sins, hear us, and grant our requests. We ask these things for Jesus' sake, amen. The offerings are for the general fund and for benevolence. We worship the Lord with our offerings.
158. 158. Versification of the psalm that we consider in connection with Lord's Day 48 and the coming of the kingdom. Let's sing stanzas 1, 3, 5, 1, 3, 6, and 8. 1, 3, 6, and 8. We read the word of God this morning from that psalm, Psalm 60. To the chief musician upon... Sushan Edith, Mictam of David, to teach. When he strove with Aram Nehraim and Aram Zobah, when Joab returned and smote of Edom in the Valley of Salt 12,000. Aram Nehraim is Syria Nehraim, and Aram Zobah is Syria Zobah. Edom is in the south, so they were fighting a two-front war, and David was fighting against Syria, a coalition of Syria, and Joab was hammering on the Edomites, and David at that time wrote this psalm to teach. O God, thou hast cast us off, thou hast scattered us. Thou hast been displeased. O turn thyself to us again. Thou hast made the earth to tremble. Thou hast broken it. Heal the breaches thereof, for it shaketh. Thou hast showed thy people hard things. Thou hast made us to drink the wine of astonishment. Thou hast given a banner to them that fear thee, that it may be displayed because of the truth that thy beloved may be delivered, save with thy right hand and hear me. God hath spoken in his holiness. I will rejoice, I will divide Shechem, and mete out the valley of Succoth. Gilead is mine, and Manasseh is mine. Ephraim also is the strength of mine head. Judah is my lawgiver. 
Moab is my wash pot. Over Edom will I cast out my shoe. Philistia, triumph thou because of me. Who will bring me into the strong city? Who will lead me into Edom? Wilt not thou, O God, which hast cast us off? Thou, O God, which didst not go out with our armies? Give us help from trouble, for vain is the help of man. Through God we shall do valiantly, for he it is that shall tread down our enemies. Thus far the reading, the holy and divine scripture and the basis of that passage and many others in the word of God. We have the teaching of our Heidelberg Catechism in Lord's Day 48. Lord's Day 48. Remember that we're considering the Lord's Prayer as the guide to teach us to pray, we considered the address, our Father. We considered the first petition, hallowed be thy name. Now we consider the second petition. Which is the second petition? Thy kingdom come. That is, rule us so by thy word and spirit that we may submit ourselves more and more to thee. Preserve and increase thy church, destroy the works of the devil, and all violence which would exalt itself against thee, and also all wicked counsels devised against thy holy word, till the full perfection of thy kingdom take place, wherein thou shalt be all in all. Beloved in the Lord Jesus Christ, Lord's Day 48 is the prayer concerning God's kingdom, specifically that God's kingdom comes. And we have to understand what that kingdom is and how it is that kingdom comes and what we pray for when we pray for the coming of that kingdom. We do so in connection with Psalm 60. Psalm 60 was David's prayer for the coming of the kingdom. The title of Psalm 60 says that David wrote it to teach. And David was teaching the people of Israel and maybe even specifically the men of the army. He was teaching them about the coming of God's kingdom. He was teaching them how that kingdom came and how that kingdom did not come, so that in the strength of the truth of the coming of the kingdom, they would fight valiantly. And when we examine David's prayer for the coming of the kingdom, his own kingdom, his own kingdom in which we behold typically as in a mirror the coming of the kingdom of Christ, David in the psalm is Christ. David's kingdom in the psalm is the kingdom of Christ. The coming of David's kingdom is the typical coming of Christ's kingdom. So that in beholding the coming of David's kingdom, we behold the coming of Christ's kingdom. And when we examine David's prayer to teach about the coming of the kingdom, it must strike us how antithetical David's prayer for the coming of kingdom, the kingdom is and how different that prayer for the coming of the kingdom is than all of the, the empty and vain and superficial talk about the coming of the kingdom that exists in the church world today. The coming of the kingdom is a huge subject and it seems everybody is talking about the coming of the kingdom. But in their prayers for the coming of the kingdom, who teaches like David does? Who prays so antithetically as David does? Moab is my wash pot, my chamber pot. That's Moab. Over Edom, I will cast out my shoe, cursed Edom. He calls for the entrance of the armies to triumph over Philistia. 
The kingdom of God in the psalm as the kingdom of God in Lord's Day 48. The kingdom of God is a kingdom in which God dwells and that exists antithetically and militantly over against the kingdoms of the world. In the kingdom of Psalm 60 as the kingdom of Psalm for Lord's Day 48, not everybody is in that kingdom. It isn't even God's will that everybody be in that kingdom. But in the coming of the kingdom in Psalm 60, the, the kingdom of God destroys the kingdoms of the world. The kingdom of God annihilates the kingdoms of the devil. David's prayer for the kingdom and the coming of the kingdom is an antithetical, militant prayer. So that that kingdom of David was at war constantly with the kingdoms of the world. And such is the prayer that Christ taught us. David prayed and taught the people of Israel to pray as Christ taught his people to pray. Tread down. David says, our enemies. Who prays that way today? You must pray that way. Tread down our enemies. Destroy them. Leave them in the dust. Bring all their counsels and their doctrines and their wicked words and their schemes to nothing. Destroy them in thy might. And so Lord taught us to pray as well. Defeat all his and our enemies. Destroy all the wicked counsels of the devil that he raises against thy church and all the wicked schemes that he raises against Thy holy word. You must understand, beloved, we exist in the world as a tiny remnant. And all around us is a hostile kingdom. And that hostile kingdom, if it could, in a moment, would swallow you up. They would destroy you. They hate you. That includes even our own flesh and blood. You better understand that. Well, they may talk nice, and they may play nice, because that's the atmosphere. It is saintly today to be nice. And so they have to play nice and speak nice, but they hate you. They'll never forget it. If you give them half a chance, they will deliver you over to death. They hate you because you are in the kingdom of Christ, and they are not. And between you exists an unbridgeable gulf and an insurmountable hostility and enmity. God did that. God separated you. God brought you into the kingdom of his dear son, and when he did that, he put enmity between you and the ungodly. And we pray that way, and we must speak that way. There are only two kingdoms in the world. It's not three, four, or five, there's two. God's and the devil's. There's only two kinds of people in the world. Not three, four, and five, there's two kinds. Elect or reprobate. Believer or unbeliever. Wicked or righteous. For God or against God. Christ's and not Christ's. And that antithesis comes right into your own life, sometimes into your own marriage, 
sometimes in, among your own children, sometimes among your own acquaintances, and also into your own church. That the kingdom of God, established by the powerful and sovereign grace of God, establishes itself in the world irresistibly. And that kingdom then, as soon as God establishes it, becomes the object of the hatred of the ungodly. That's what happened in Psalm 60. God established David's kingdom. And so soon as that kingdom was established, all the nations around rose up to destroy it. Syria came in from the north. Edom came up from the south. Philistia tore in from the west. Moab came in from the east. They were going to destroy it. They saw God in it. They saw Christ in it. And it, it stirred them up to hatred. And now David, David and his men, Christ and his church, are in a two-front, multi-front war. And in that situation, which is our situation, surrounded by a hostile kingdom, David wrote Psalm 60 to teach. To teach about the coming of the kingdom of God. Maybe even to teach specifically his soldiers who had their helmets on and their breastplates strapped down and their swords by their sides and their feet shod to teach them how the kingdom comes. That too is the theme of Psalm 48, that God's kingdom comes. Let's consider that Lord's Day under that theme briefly, that God's kingdom comes. Notice that's, that's a statement, that God's kingdom comes, period. Not, it might come, not, if you, do, if you do your part, it should come. That God's kingdom comes. That's the truth. And you have to notice in that idea that there is, there is a kingdom that comes. You have to understand the coming of that kingdom. And only if you understand that kingdom and you understand the coming of that kingdom can you also then pray for it properly. God has a kingdom, and the Lord, when the Lord taught us to pray, taught us to pray for that grand reality of the kingdom of God. Uh, Jesus taught us to pray for great things. He didn't teach us to pray for some little piece of the earth. He didn't teach us merely to pray for the success in our business or for an increased bank account or friends in the world. He didn't even teach us to pray for peace on earth. He taught us to pray for the coming of God's kingdom. And that coming of God's kingdom, that kingdom of God is a grand and universal reality. You can't see it now. God's kingdom that we talk about in the petition and that we speak about in Psalm 60 and its typical form in David, that kingdom, if you can imagine it, is the building that God is building hidden behind the scaffolding of the world. God created this world in its earthly form with the things that we can see and the things that we can touch and hear and smell. And this earthly form of the world is merely an external scaffolding behind which God builds his kingdom. The kingdom of God is the thing. Just as when you build a house, you, you build up all the scaffolding, you you, you do all kinds of things that are necessary to build that house, but those things are not going to last. You might put up some temporary bracing. 
You might have a torn up lawn as the equipment moves all around that lawn and moves things to build that house. You certainly have all kinds of scaffolding around that house so that the materials can go up and down and that house can take its shape. All of those temporary things are this world. Nothing in this world lasts at all. God will destroy this world and its form and all of its works. He will tear down the scaffolding just as the man who builds a house. He's going to tear down all of the externals. He's going to finish finally that house. And the lawn will be planted in all those tracks from all those machines will be covered up. All of the scaffolding will be removed. All of the exterior will be put on. And that house will be fit to live in. That's the coming of God's kingdom. The house is God's kingdom. And everything else is it's temporal. So that the kingdom of God that we talk about in Lord's Day 48 is the eternal reality of all things. It's what God is aiming for. It is what God is doing when he created the world and in all of his providence. It's a kingdom that is the perfection of God's covenant and the perfection of God's covenant and of all things so that God is all in all. You can think of the kingdom that way. The kingdom is when God is all in all. When everything is as a piece of crystal through which shines the brilliance of the glory of God so that from heaven above to hell beneath all radiates the glory of God so that all shows forth His power and His grace and His glory transparently. God has made perfect God's eternal covenant. When the earth is lifted up and joined with the heavenly, when the, the ox and the lamb and the wolf and the lion, they all lay together in peace. And when all the wicked have been destroyed out of the earth, that is God's kingdom. And so we must define that kingdom. When we talk about the kingdom of God, you understand we can speak of that in different ways. There is the kingdom of God, which emphasizes that God conceived it. God brings it, and its goal is God. We can call it the kingdom of Christ, and that emphasizes the centrality of Jesus Christ in the reality of God's kingdom. Jesus Christ is the king. He's the one appointed by God in whom God will perfect his kingdom. Sometimes we call it the kingdom of heaven to emphasize that that kingdom is a spiritual and not a carnal reality. To emphasize that the goal of that kingdom is to create all things after the pattern of the heavenly and not of the earthly. Or sometimes we just call it the kingdom because that kingdom is that because of which all other things exist and because of which all other things happen. In that kingdom, the catechism defines for us, the catechism teaches us that the kingdom of God is God's gracious rule in the hearts and lives of his people so that they submit to him. That's the kingdom. In any kingdom of the earth, <clears throat> that kingdom 
is simply where the king rules. That kingdom is simply the extension of the king's person. And so the kingdom of God is where God rules. He rules by grace. The kingdom of God is a kingdom of grace. And he rules by his grace so that his people submit to him. That's a very important point. It's not the rule of God's grace so that if his people decide to, they will submit to him. It's not the rule of his grace so that if his people do something right, they can submit to him. It's not the rule of his grace so that if they are first, then they can submit to him. That's not it. That's not reform. It's the rule of God's grace so that by the power of God's grace, they actually submit to him. He causes them by the power of his rule to submit unto him so that they love him, so that they forsake the world, so that they hate sin and fight against it, and so that they repent. Repentance is in something you do to experience the kingdom what folly. You have to repent first and then you can experience forgiveness. Let me tell you what theology that is. You have to repent first and then you can experience the kingdom. That's the theology. You are in the kingdom, so you repent, of course, but you have to repent first, you do, as that which you do to experience something else in the kingdom. The kingdom is just a series of steps leading deeper into the kingdom and I guess finally to heaven. And each one of those steps is what you have to do to finally get to heaven. The coming of the kingdom is really what you have to do. The thought of the catechism is entirely different. The kingdom is the gracious rule of God in the hearts and lives of his people so that they submit to him. When you repent, you have just experienced the coming of the kingdom. When you, <clears throat> when you experience the forgiveness of sins and the assurance of your salvation, the kingdom has come. God did that. God did that by the power of his grace. God didn't do that because you did something. God did that uh, sovereignly, according to his own will and purpose for your salvation. Kingdom is God's gracious rule on the hearts and lives of his people so that they submit to him. And when we define the kingdom as God's gracious rule, then we have to make a distinction. The kingdom is God's gracious rule in distinction from, let's say, God's providential rule. There is a rule of God over all things. It's the rule of God as creator. It's the rule of God simply by, by reason of the fact that all things exist according to his counsel. All things are controlled and all things happen according to that counsel and might of God. That's his providential rule. In that sense, the rule of God does not come. It always and eternally is. There's no coming. You're not praying that the Lord eventually is going to rule over all parts of the world so that all things are finally controlled by God. That right now some things are controlled by the devil and some things are controlled by God and therefore you pray, let all things be controlled by God. That's not the prayer for the coming of the kingdom. All things are controlled by God. He made the wicked, even the wicked for the day of evil. Uh, he controls the devil so the devil can't do one thing without the sovereign authority and power of God. He controls all the wicked. They can't so much as twitch without his will. God controls all things. There's no coming of the rule of God in that sense. When we pray for the coming of the kingdom, we're praying for the coming of the, grace of, of the gracious rule of God in the hearts and lives of his people. We're praying for the coming of the perfection of that kingdom in God's eternal kingdom in heaven. 
That comes. Everything served God in the beginning. And all things fell under the power, according to God's own sovereignty, all things fell under the power of sin and death and the curse. In order that God could show the power of his grace, in order that God could show himself to be sovereign, in order that God could glorify himself in the coming of another kingdom, a kingdom of Jesus Christ, a kingdom of his gracious rule, a kingdom in which God transparently is all in all. And that kingdom, that kingdom is a spiritual kingdom then. It has nothing to do with your clothes or your health. Even your happiness in this life has nothing to do with it. The kingdom of God is not as in food. It's not in raiment. It's not in gold or silver at all. I think that's one of the consequences of the carnal theology that we left. One of the consequences is going to be, if it is not already, making the kingdom of God consist in things. Don't ever forget that. There's a practical common grace that goes along with it. When you, when you behave the right way, let's say, and you do the right things, supposedly, and, and you repent at the right time, then, according to that theology, you experience the blessing of God. But you must understand, so carnal is man, that that blessing of God is going to be described, if it is not already, as a happy earthly life. Well, because I obeyed God, and because I repented of my sins, and because I have an organized life, and because I do everything rightly in an outward way, I should have an, an, a pleasant outward life. See, my business is prospering, and see, I got to go on this vacation, and see, I'm healthy, and see, I have all my children. See, I don't, I don't have any trouble in my family because I denied the gospel, it's carnal. But the kingdom of God isn't carnal. The kingdom of God does not consist, consist in food and raiment and gold and silver. The kingdom of God is spiritual. It consists in the rule of Jesus Christ by his word and by his spirit so that he lays hold on his people he regenerates them. He transforms them. He forgives all of their sins. He imputes to them righteousness. He promises to them eternal life. That's the kingdom. The kingdom is life with God. To know God in Jesus Christ as the God of our salvation. That's the kingdom. To hate sin and to turn from sin. To war against sin. That's the kingdom. To oppose antithetically all false doctrine. That's the kingdom. To hate our own flesh and blood. So that we hate father, we hate mother, we hate brother, we hate sister. That's the kingdom. The hatred, you understand, that's never malice or unrighteousness, but a hatred that is a denunciation of their unbelief and of their false doctrine, a hatred that consists in a refusal to condone it, a refusal to associate with it, a, few, a refusal to, to tolerate it, that's the kingdom. 
That's the spiritual nature of the kingdom as God lays hold on the hearts and lives of his people and he transforms them. The kingdom is not what you do, it's what Christ does. The kingdom of God is the rule of Christ. Wherever Christ is, by his word and by his spirit, so that he draws his people out of the world, he consecrates them to himself, he applies to them all of his salvation, he assures them of eternal life. There is the kingdom. The kingdom, the kingdom is wrapped up in the person of Jesus Christ. Really, if someone asked you, well, what is the kingdom of God? You would say Christ Jesus is the kingdom of God. In Christ Jesus personally, that is, in his own person, the one who says I in Jesus Christ, that's the Word. That's the second person of the Holy Trinity. In that one person of Jesus Christ, God and man are perfectly united so that that man, Jesus Christ, is perfectly submissive to God. He seeks the glory of God in everything. He, he strives after that glory of God. He labors for that glory of God. He works that God may be all in all. The kingdom is simply Christ. And as we are incorporated into Christ by a true and living faith, as we are made one with Christ, so we are brought into Christ's kingdom. And therefore, as the very essence of that kingdom, You must say this, the kingdom is that God is all in all. I know the kingdom has blessings of salvation. The kingdom is salvation. You may never forget that either. The kingdom is salvation. When God saves you, he brings you into the kingdom. There's nothing you need to do to get into the kingdom. There's nothing you need to do to stay in the kingdom. God brings you into the kingdom. God keeps you in the kingdom. There's nothing you need to do to be perfected in the kingdom. God brings you in. God keeps you in the kingdom. And God perfects you in the kingdom. The coming of the kingdom is your salvation. When God saves you, that's the kingdom. And you can say, too, then, all who continue in their wicked and ungrateful lives, they're not in the kingdom. You don't say to them as they continue in your wicked and ungrateful lives, well, you have to do this to get into the kingdom. And if you'll just do this to get into the kingdom, you can be in the kingdom. No, you testify to them because you're living a wicked and ungrateful life. You are not in the kingdom. You never let them stay at ease in that position. You never assure them of the favor of God in that position. You never comfort them in that position. You tell them, not you haven't done enough to get in the kingdom. You simply say to them, you testify, you're not in the kingdom. Your own wicked life and your unbelief and your hatred of the truth and your persecution of the people of God, testify that you have no part in the kingdom. The kingdom of salvation, when that kingdom lays hold on someone, they are absolutely changed. They become a new person. God becomes everything in their life. And they and their uh, life becomes nothing. They become concerned and distraught and sorrowful over their sin. And 
They hate the world. And they loathe or the lie. The kingdom has come to them. But that kingdom is not, first of all, or even mainly about getting people saved. There is salvation in the kingdom. We never misunderstand that. But that kingdom is not about your and my salvation. That kingdom is about God. It's about God, the glory of God, the power of God, the grace of God, the justice of God, the holiness of God. It's about God being all in all. And in that sense, the kingdom must come. God is in his own being. God is in all that he does, God. No one can take from him his glory. No one interrupts his plans. No one stymies him. God is God. And so when we say God must become all in all, what we mean is this, that that glory of God shine out in the whole creation, that every creature testify of that glory, so that the, the, the glorified in heaven, all they speak about is the glory of God, and the damned in hell, all they testify to, is the glory of God, so that every creature radiates that glory, so that all things are lifted up to participate in that glory. That's the coming of the kingdom. So that his name is glorified. And in that sense, the kingdom must come. The world does everything in its power to debase God. The false church does everything in its power to debase God. And in that world, over against that opposition, you understand God willed that opposition, that opposition too serves his glory. That that opposition, that hatred, that constant attempt to overthrow God and to destroy his truth may serve to show the invincibility of God and the ineffectual nature of that opposition. And too, you must understand that coming, in that sense too, is always a wonder of grace. God willed that his kingdom always be brought in this world into an impossible situation. That from the point of view of man, there was no way out. That must be. That must be so that man can never claim the credit for the coming of the kingdom of God. And the ultimate form of that is that that kingdom of God always comes by the wonder of resurrection. There's always death and resurrection involved in the coming of the kingdom of God. That's what the cross of Jesus Christ demonstrated. The wicked laid hold on Jesus Christ and the wicked tried Jesus Christ And the wicked nailed Jesus Christ to the cross. And by doing that, they damned the kingdom of God. They took God by the throat. And they held God down and had him in their power. And on the third day, God rose. By the wonder of grace. That's how his kingdom comes. Always. That's why we were brought out the way we were brought out. They had to they had to take God by the throat. 
That's what they did, you know. They took hold of God. And they said, you will not rule here. We will rule. And they tried God. And they found him guilty. And they crucified him. And cast him out. And he rose from the dead. And he preserved his truth. And he preserved his true church. And he preserved the remnant of his favor. That's how the kingdom always comes. It never comes any other way than by death and resurrection. That's what David's talking about in Psalm 60. There is death in Psalm 60. God did not go out with our host, David says. God gave us to drink of the wine of astonishment. The wine of astonishment is a drug-laced wine that stupefies and confuses. When you have the wine of astonishment, you have, you have no idea what end is up or down. God gave them to drink of the wine of astonishment. And when David talks that way, that God did not go out with our host, and God gave us to drink of the wine of astonishment, David is talking about Saul's kingdom. A wicked man was in power. He was an unbeliever and a reprobate, although he always talked about God. And he swore many oaths. He was an unbeliever. He was a reprobate. God put him there. God put him there to humble Israel. Saul's theology, you understand. Saul had a theology. Saul's theology is the kingdom of God comes. By the grace of God and by the responsibility of man. Saul's theology was God's kingdom comes by the grace of God and by the obedience of man. God's kingdom comes by God and man cooperating together. That was Saul's theology. Saul was a synergist. Saul was an Arminian. Saul was a Roman Catholic. Saul was Protestant Reformed. That was his theology. And God brought that to the nation of Israel to teach them. And when that theology came in the person of Saul, God did not go out with their host. And God gave them to drink of the wine of astonishment. So they were stupefied and confused. And they said, what is going on? That happened. I remember very well coming home from classes and synods and praying, Lord, why did you not go with our host? I remember praying, Lord, don't you care about your truth? What is happening in our churches? I remember praying it. Because the truth would come to the assemblies. That truth would come in the form of protests or or letters of concern or or in the the speech of some of the delegates. The The truth would come. And the truth would go down to defeat. And the armies of Israel would be defeated. And the foes of the truth would triumph. And you could see them rejoicing in the back in their victory. He didn't go out with our hosts. And you would come home and you'd be astonished. What happened? Why did the truth not triumph? 
The truth always triumphs. No, it doesn't. No, it goes down to defeat sometimes. He doesn't go out with our host. The truth is crucified, and the truth is buried in the ground. The people, our people are given to drink of the wine of astonishment. And that illustrates powerfully that the kingdom of God does not come by the will, the work, and the efforts of man. That's what David wanted to teach the army. The army had Syria Zoba and Syria Nehoram surrounding them on this side. They had Philistia on this side. They had Moab and Ammon over here, and they had Edom over here, and they were all coming at once. And in that army was all the men who had fought in Saul's army and who had been defeated Time after time after time after time. And David says to them, yes. Yes, God did not go out with our host. And yes, God gave us to drink of the wine of astonishment. But you understand who God is. God has promised. God has spoken in his holiness. God has given a word that he will not go back to. God has said that Israel is his people and that Moab is his washpot and over Edom will he cast out his shoe. God has promised to save his people, to deliver them, to bring them into his, his eternal kingdom, to bless them. And man can't bring it. David says, vain is the help of man. The help of man isn't weak. The help of man is vain. Vanity is not merely ineffectual. Something can be ineffectual. It doesn't work. It's broken. It's weak. David doesn't say it's in effect. He says it's vain. I think maybe one of the most poignant examples in all of creation of vanity is a miscarriage. You have all the excitement and you have all of the labor that goes into that so that this body is, is working to keep this baby alive, to cause the baby to grow. And the baby grows for nine months. And the mother even goes through, through birth and all the pains and labors of birth. And the baby dies. Vanity of vanity, saith the preacher. All is vanity. That's man. That's man in all his efforts, in all his works, in all his labors. That's man in all that he does by grace, too. When they say to you, but we do this all by grace, beloved, think of a, a miscarried baby. When they say to you, this is, this is God wrought and God worked, think of a miscarried baby. That's all man is. That's all man ever does. Vain is the help of man. Man cannot bring God's kingdom. Man does not bring God's kingdom. Even by what man does by grace, he doesn't bring God's kingdom. Vain is the help of man. Church has to know that. 
That's what David's armies had to know. When they were lined up facing the Philistines and the Moabites and the Ammonites and the Syrians and the Edomites, <clears throat> vain is the help of man. David didn't tell them, now, now you all have to do your best. Now you do know that you have to fight. Don't think you don't have to fight. You have to fight, you know. You better all be valiant in the army. You all do a good job now. Don't be cowards. He didn't tell them that. He said, all your efforts are vain. That's what he taught them. Vain is the help of man. But through God, we shall do valiantly. God is not vain. And the help that God gives, God gives help, David says. The help that God gives is God himself. You must understand that. God helps us. That isn't that God picks us up. And God uses, uh, the help of God is God himself. You can say the help of God is Jesus Christ. Whatever God does by his help, God does. Whatever God does by his, his, his help, Christ does. By grace, you understand, we do this all by grace. That doesn't mean this. God gives you enough grace so that you have the power to do it. To do something by grace doesn't mean that you are enabled to do something that you couldn't otherwise do, but you wanted to. To, to, to do this by grace does not mean that you are enabled now to do what God does. That is not what it means. To do it by grace means God does it. God does it. Your help is vain. You don't do it. You don't bring the kingdom. You don't repent. You don't turn. You don't win any souls. You don't convert anybody. Vain is the help of man. But through God we shall do valiantly. God does it. That's his help. Christ does it. That's his help. And through God you do valiantly. And if you understand that, that God brings his kingdom, he brings it powerfully, sovereignly, efficaciously, with divine irresistibility. He brings it according to his eternal will and good pleasure for the salvation of his people and damnation of the ungodly. He defeats irresistibly and perfectly all the evil counsels that are raised against his church. He destroys all the works of the devil. <clears throat> he certainly delivers his people. Those are all objective certain things. <clears throat> Those aren't maybes. Those aren't if you do your part, that will happen. God's kingdom comes. God's kingdom comes by God and by Christ, and not by you. Then you pray for it. Then you pray, pray for it first of all in your own life, because you look around in your own life and you see how much is contrary to the kingdom of God. You look around in your own life and you look into your, your inner being and you see how much is opposed to God. And even let's say there even isn't anything that's opposed to God in your whole life, but you look in your life and you examine your inner being and you see how little 
is actually devoted to the glory of God. You see how far the kingdom must come? You don't even have to look into the world. You don't even have to look into the false church. Look at yourself once and see, Lord, let thy kingdom come. Cause me more and more by the power of thy spirit and word to submit unto thee that I will thy will, that I seek thy glory, that I put away concern for myself that I don't love this world and the things of the world, but I seek heaven. That I be sorry for my sins, that I experience the joy of my salvation, the certainty of my eternal life in heaven. Lord, cause thy kingdom to come. Lord, gather thy church. When you look and you see how many words you've spoken to those that you love and they spurn them. You examine how many things you've written to those that you love and they hate you. You hear the testimony of the gospel go out and you say, maybe this time. Then you pray, Lord, cause thy kingdom to come. We can't make them see. We can't make them believe. We can't turn them. We can't open their eyes or their ears. Cause thy kingdom to come. And you look in your life and you see how carnal we are. Beloved, we are carnal. I see it. We like this world. We love this world. We seek it. This world is already crumbling. It's shaking. The tremors of the final earthquake are coming. The smoke of the final burning is already seen. And the first wisps of the final whirlwind can be felt. Lord, Cause thy kingdom to come. Tear down this world. Destroy all its wicked works. And perfect us in thy whole church in the everlasting kingdom of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank thee for thy holy word. We're sorry, Lord, for our lack of interest in thy kingdom. Forgive us our sin and cause thy kingdom to come in our own hearts, in our own lives, that we may submit unto thee, gather, defend, and preserve thy church, destroy the whole kingdom of the devil, and finally, perfect thy kingdom, in which thou shalt be all in all. For Jesus' sake, amen. Three hundred ninety-seven. Three hundred ninety-seven. <clears throat> Let's sing one and eight.
grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.